Welcome back. And sorry, I've been away for a few weeks. Well, not really away. I've just been really busy at work and mostly procrastinating around the Z80. Meaning I've been designing a few things during my spare time that's not really related to the Z80 core. I've done a few things, such as correcting the clock circuit. One of my subscribers pointed out to me that while the programmable clock is glitch-free, the manual one wasn't really. And that's a good point. So I added a couple of JK flip-flops and an extra multiplexer to resolve the issue. Big shout out to Adrien Kolbeka for the inspiration. Check out his channel. His 65816 build is really cool. Here's a quick montage of the changes I've made. Next on the list is an 8-slot backplane using card edge connectors. As you can see, it's fairly compact. The card edge connectors used are 62-pin ISA XT style ones. I got a good deal on them at a local electronics store. On the front is a breadboard friendly header. On the left, we have the on-off switch. Right beside it, you have a 5 volt barrel jack connector for powering the backplane. I know that some prefer to have a higher source voltage and regulate it with a 7805, for example, but that limits the current to 1 amp on average. I wanted some headroom for future expansion, just in case. I did add a 3.3 volt regulator, but that's optional. It doesn't need to be there. There are two indicator LEDs, one for 5V and the other for 3.3V. Alas, I noticed the uh, silt screen does not show up on some parts. Actually, most of the parts. I made a mistake when I output the Gerber files. My bad. I'll have to be careful next time. I have standoffs only in the back. In the front, they're a tad too close to the power rail if I leave it on. So you either put the standoffs and you remove the power rail of the breadboard or you don't put the standoffs. And that's what I chose to do. It's not easy to press fit it in. So it's important to take the time to align it and carefully push it down firmly with a reasonable amount of force. I don't want to bend the pins or damage the breadboard. In this case, as you can see, it's a bit harder than expected because it's a cheap breadboard. But with my regular busboard branded breadboards, say that three times in a row, it's a lot easier. This is a passive backplane, so it's just your run of the mill parallel traces going from one end to the other with filtering capacitors on the power traces. Now, because I don't have bus termination and because I branch out to a header, I could have some issues at higher speeds, and that's why I chose to make a complex variable clock circuit. It's a test things out. Another side project I worked on is a high density DIP64 1.77mm pitch to breadboard adapter. I made these more than I needed, so I could experiment with a Yamaha V9958 instead of the tried and true TMS9918A or 28A. Yes, you caught me. I made those at JLC PCB and no, I'm not sponsored yet, but in my case, they come out cheaper than other manufacturers, including the shipping, and that's why I chose them. I may put those adapters for sale for a token price if there's interest in them. I received the sockets not too long ago, so let's open the package and see if they fit. You never know, my custom keycap footprint might be slightly off. Yes, perfect fit. I just need to solder the socket before the headers 
Otherwise, it's going to be hard to put the iron in if I put the adders first. With one power rail, you only get one series of holes on the breadboard. But if you have two power rails, it gives you three holes to work with. In my usual setups, I only use one power rail because it takes up less space for long boards. But I may put two in case, just for that row. Also, I've been working on a keyboard. Yes, a keyboard because why not? I already did the PS2 thing with my 6502 homebrew, but this time I figured I'd make my own keyboard, all the while trying to respect the 60% form factor. And it's a mechanical keyboard with um, cherry switches. Instead of having 61 keys like a regular 60% keyboard, I made it with 64 keys so it occupies the full 8 rows by 8 column matrix. I place silt screen on both sides and I also put the row and column numbers for each key for reference purposes. Also, every key has a diode to prevent back current. All the holes for the standoffs are designed with the 60% standard in mind. I also put some extra holes just in case I wanted to make my own case. Oops, what's this? Looks like some sort of residue from the manufacturing process. That's the first time I've seen this. Since my clock was pretty much complete, I decided to make the PCB for it. So here it is, the first card in the series, fully silk screened and annotated on both sides. Here is a header for the reset and clock outputs. I have LED galores because I like to light things up like a Christmas tree. From left to right you have the reset LED and button, the clock LED, the single step button and LED indicator, the mode select to change between single step and constant clock, and the speed button to switch between slow and fast clock, the four fast clock LEDs, the slow clock potentiometer and LED indicator. On the front side, there are four slide switches to control the various speed rates at power up and or reset events. On a side note, when I ordered the switches from AliExpress, I had no idea they were so big. It's a good thing I designed the PCB after receiving the parts. They seem to fit very nicely though. From the top, there's the power up mode select switch and the second is the power up speed select switch. The bottom two switches control the fast clock speed selection on reset. So basically it's a two digit binary number where the third switch is the LSB and the fourth switch is the MSB. If, for example, I had a 16 MHz oscillator, 00 would output a safe 1 MHz clock, 01 would be 2 MHz, 10 would be 4 MHz, and 11 would be 8 MHz. In my project, I'll be using a 14.7456 MHz oscillator, which gives me a 7.3728 MHz clock when divided through a D flip flop, which turns out to be a good clock speed to drive the SIO. But in the end, I may just drive the SIO with a separate 1.8432 MHz oscillator and run the CPU at 10 MHz. I'll get the best of both worlds. Now, to insert a card on the backplane, I just need to align the component side of the card to the component side label on the backplane. The mating of the card on the card edge connector is perfect. That's a really good job. By the way, all the expansion cards will be no larger than 100mm squared, you know, to keep the cost of prototyping down. And now the cart before the horse, yay, the CPU and memory card. Yes, I know I haven't tested the CPU on the breadboard yet. 
yet here it is. But I base my design on Grant Searle's and John Winan's design. So in theory, it should work. Crossing my fingers on that. On the PCB, you can tell I labeled it with a 10 megahertz Z80 CPU. Above that, there's a 512 kilobyte of RAM, which will be banked in 32 kilobyte chunks. On the other side is the bank select circuitry. And above the RAM is a 120 kilobyte flash that is hardwired to 64K. As you can see, the silk screen is on both sides. I'm just not quite sure if it's too much. What do you think? I also have LED galore because, you know, Christmas tree and all. From left to right, you have the M1, MREC, IOREC, read, write, wait, halt, int, NMI, bus rec, bus ACK, ROM, and RAM selects. It's not going to be useful at high clock speeds. I mean, it's going to be lit 100% of the time, but it is going to be practical for debugging at slow and single step clock speeds. I think I'm going to do the PCB and forego the breadboard altogether. Uh, I like to live dangerously, I guess. It might work or it might not, but I'm fairly confident it will. In my PCB layout design, I made sure I could put a ZIF socket. The ZIF itself will be mounted on a socket, as I don't want to waste a perfectly good ZIF on a prototype. Now let's see if it fits. I think the pins are a bit crooked, so I need to be careful. Yes, it looks good. I'm quite pleased. On the side note, do you think there's some interest for mailbag videos? Because I receive quite a lot of components that I purchase and sometimes people are interested to see what others bought. So I may put videos like that, if there's interest. So, that's it for episode 4. Thank you for watching, and leave comments down below if you so wish. Please help this channel grow by subscribing, hitting the notification bell, and of course clicking the like button. You know, YouTube algorithm and all. See you next time.